Welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I interview artists and creatives about the how and why of what they do. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, an actor and an artist, and in this mini-series of the podcast, I'm focusing on the topic of creative risk, diving into practices that embody a high degree of risk-taking and uncertainty, but in very different ways. This conversation is with Kate Malone. Kate is one of the UK's leading ceramic artists with an illustrious career spanning over 30 years. Her work is inspired by the joy and optimism of nature, and often features large, handmade pieces inspired by fruit, nuts, berries, and even pumpkins. Much of her work is colored by the addition of crystalline glazes, and she is renowned for her research and experimentation in this area, and we dig into that a bit in the conversation. Her exuberant work has won her an array of commissions and collaborations, including major public art projects, and Kate was awarded an MBE in 2019 for services to ceramic art. Some of the topics we cover in this conversation include managing risk and uncertainty, both in her studio-based practice as well as when undertaking ambitious public art projects, developing confidence as a maker, finding your own artistic voice, how she thinks about selling her work in an elite marketplace. And we finish with an absolutely brilliant challenge that you can apply to your own creative practice. So please enjoy this energizing and thought-provoking conversation. Okay, so if you're happy, we'll just jump right in. Let's do that, Jeremiah. Okay, so my first question is, who are you and what do you do? So my name is Kate Olivia Malone. I am 61 years old and I am a ceramic artist or potter or ceramist, whatever anybody cares to call me. <laughs> and uh, first, and who am I? I'm a happy potter. That's what I am. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that's a lovely, <laughs> lovely descriptive phrase. And <laughs> why clay? What, what drew you to working with, with clay and ceramics? Why clay? So um, I went to a great, big, rough, comprehensive school very progressive comprehensive school in the 70s so I was born in 59 so I was you know I went to this school when I was 11 until 18 very big really quite rough you know the students went on strike and locked themselves in the top floor and threw all the furniture out the windows you know it was kind of quite a raw community wow however and I sort of was deputy head girl at the end and I was very sort of involved in the community however um it had a fantastic art department, a whole block of art, a building. And in the 70s, the British policy for arts education and creative education was brilliant. It was as important for a child, a young person, to study creativity as maths and English and history and geography and all the other subjects. So as a child from 11 to 15, I tried metalwork, woodwork, pottery, sewing, home economics um, and it was a big part of the sort of bi-weekly timetable where you had ho a whole solid afternoon of craft or art and we did printing and so I mean it was just I didn't realize at the time how absolutely extraordinarily brilliant it was and I don't think it was my school particular I think it was that whole era of mm -hmm. education the government was experimenting uh, with uh, allowing creativity and look at the results you know 30 years on there's this incredible you know there's just this incredible creativity that I think is born of this fantastic policy however it's not the same these days I have to say and I've mm. got a lot to say about that <laughs> but essentially you know I fell in love with clay age 12 looking through the sort of window of the ceramics room, which was sort of smeared with clay, of course, a rather bohemian and uh, sort of uh, attractive pottery teacher <laughs> who was a really good <laughs> teacher who, who sadly died recently. I was in touch with him, you know, for 60 years and uh, or 50 years, and he passed away a few months ago, Pete Evely, and he was just a, he was a good teacher, mm. and uh, I was lucky. So it was right time, right place. And and you've never been felt the call to explore other media to go to to leave that and move on to other other yes, forms. Yes, that's an interesting question actually, because when it came in England, you did your GCSEs and then your A levels, and then uh, you did a, an arts foundation course of one year where you could try everything from mm -hmm. fashion to photography to sculpture and welding, and you know really get a good breadth of the arts. 
And so I did do that and went into it with an open mind thinking I might change my mind, but I absolutely didn't, you know, having, having sort of sampled the excitement and the sense of achievement from ceramics, uh, I just wanted to continue with that. Because, you know, as a child, especially doing ceramics, you witness all the elements, earth, air, fire and water all coming together for you. And you feel incredibly uh, enabled and capable when you do make something and it comes out quite nicely, you know, so you can give it to your parents or whatever. And, uh, yeah, that feeling has never diminished. Yeah, I think that's one of the wonderful things about it is the the initial technical skill to shape a piece of clay is so minimal that it it takes very little to do that. So versus something like wood or metal or something that's more rigid that it's, Mm. and it's so responsive that, that you can with very little effort start to create something that, that looks like something else or is captures something. And I, I think that's something we all, that, that that it just as children generally really enjoy the, the the ability to to affect the world around us and clay is such a a great medium to explore that with and if you can get your hands on it at a young enough age I can see how that would just carry on through and you never want to leave it. Yeah, I encourage all parents, you know, to get their kids to feel the malleability of three dimensional clay and the mm. beauty, the coolness of it and the way it changes in front of you. You sort of witness things and so it's pleasure plus sort of a sense of achievement and mm. yeah, it's a great thing. Great thing. Yeah. And you work a lot with crystalline glazes. Is is are they uh do you work exclusively with crystalline or do you move do you explore other forms of glaze. And actually, as a precursor, for people who don't know about ceramics and crystalline glazes, could you explain what a crystalline glaze is? Okay, so I shall, yes. Um, So first of all, a crystalline glaze is a glaze that melts in the kiln like many other glazes, shiny glazes. Um, But during the cooling, after the melt point, um, it's a high-fired stoneware glaze, so it goes up to 1,260 degrees centigrade because um, mm. in England we work in centigrade and essentially during the cooling cycle the crystals form and actually grow within the glassy matrix which is liquid at those temperatures and these crystals grow and form and then fix um, much like um, a diamond or an emerald is growing you know in Brazil there are these emerald mines aren't there and you sort of mm. dig into the earth and there are crystals that have formed there and the reason those crystals have formed is mixing of minerals heating and cooling and all the environments have to be right so when you fire crystalline glazes you simulate that that volcanic activity and you make sure that your glazed recipe has the right ingredients that are conducive to crystal growth which is a lot of zinc in effect Um, and the crystals grow and so with ceramics, you witness the transformation normal. With sort of, let's say, normal ceramics, you make something out of soft clay and you fire it and it becomes rock hard. And then you glaze it with a dry, powdery glaze and you fire it and it's shiny or matte or very a beautiful surface. So you witness the magic of transformation with ceramics by doing ordinary, everyday pottery. Not that pottery is ever ordinary. But then with ceramics, there's this added layer of wonder where these crystals grow as well on the surface Mm. and they can be very very dramatic they can be tiny crystals which is a sort of adventure in glaze or they can be great big crystals that are size of a pansy or a butterfly wing and much like nature is similar across the board in different natural things it is like jack frost on the window pane and it is like a crystal and it is like a butterfly wing and so it's really a very magical thing it can be a bit um, overpowering on ceramics because the effect is very uh, like 1970s disco wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be quite careful mm. <laughs> or you have to really go for it, you know, yeah. rather. But um, yeah, so crystal glazes are that. Um, like when you overboil, when you're making jam or toffee and you overboil sugar and water, the, there's a super saturation of solution and sugar crystals kind of suddenly get thrown out if you get it wrong. Mm. And so it's a similar thing at high temperatures. Um, and really, yes, in answer to the beginning of this question, I do mostly do crystalline glazes. Uh, every glaze has a recipe. 
and you weigh out all the ingredients of the recipe, of the specific recipe, mix it with water, sieve it, and put it on your pot by dipping, pouring, or painting. Mm. And um, I have the largest, I think, the largest crystalline glazed stoneware archive in the country. Oh, um, in my that. little beautiful studio in London. And I've collated it all with various assistants and interns into the most extraordinary directory recipe book, which is not yet published, but bits of it have been. And um, I do intend to eventually publish my research. And I've been researching crystalline glazes for over 20 years. I think probably 15 to 20% of my time is researching glaze. Wow, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and why, why crystalline? Because my understanding is they're one of the most tricky glazes to work with, that you need to have a very precise heating and cooling uh, cycle in the kiln and your ingredients have to be just right. The shapes of the things that you're putting the glaze on have to be just right. That, that it, it's, it's probably the most challenging glaze to be in an already challenging medium, ceramics, where there's so many uh, things that can go wrong at so many parts in the process. Now, when you get to the final stage, you've already <laughs> made the thing, it hasn't blown up in the kiln and the bisque firing, and now you're ready to decorate it with something beautiful. You're putting the most challenging surface on it and, and then opening up a whole other door of of potential failure what what mm. drives you to to go there That's <laughs> to, very to continue yeah. to go with that well i'd say jeremiah you're right in all those cases but at the same time of it being very demanding and the pre you have to have sort of certain rules because the glaze is very fluid at top temperature it's dripping off mm. the pot much like wax drips off away from a candle you know on a windy day um so it is challenging, but at the same time, don't tell everyone. It's one of the most forgiving glazes you could ever imagine. Really? Because, you know, you can't put it on too thickly because it runs off. You, can't, you can put it on too thinly, so you have to be aware of mm. that. Um, you, well, it's just, it's melt point. It's the window of the melt point is so wide that there isn't really a crucial temperature to it. And, in fact, I have this... Uh, uh, a team of assistants and apprentices and uh, one by one they all see how sort of easy it is <laughs> to make a <laughs> pot look great <laughs> and uh, a lot of them are using crystalline glazes in their own work I have a team but they only work two days a week for me so that they can have their own practice in their own studio mm. but you know a lot of them maybe not as their main part yeah a couple of them as their main part of their work they sort of just see and experience the wonder of crystals, not just the magic that you're sort of growing your own diamonds in effect, but um, the fact that it is a very, very forgiving glaze. Yes, it drips. Yes, you have to make tra a tray for every single piece and it has to be stilted. And yes, after you've fired and the glaze is set, there's a sort of dribble drip bottom that has to be polished and ground. But really, it's just very kind. My clay's kind. I've got a very fantastic clay that I use. And the glaze is a pretty kind glaze, actually. So you're right and wrong. Okay. Well, okay. Th this is great because um, I, I have also seen, you have a fantastic uh, Instagram account, which we spoke about Thank earlier. You. And Thank I you. encourage anyone who's interested in Kate's work or, or would like to see what a crystalline glaze looks like, check out her Instagram account. But I've also seen uh, some very complex pieces that you've built that you built by hand that that have been assembled they've been you've taken a long time to let them dry so they don't crack they've gone into the bisque kiln the bisque firing and they've come out in pieces they've just shattered well jeremiah it's only happened once in 30 years no really yeah it own, and it was through my own stupidity i mean ah, ceramics okay. takes no prisoners ceramics is mm -hmm. a piece you know, you have to follow all the rules. But no, it doesn't happen very often. And if it doesn't work with glaze, you can pop it back in and put more on. You know, I've developed mm. this technique. Um, originally, I, when I started out, I had, didn't have enough money to spray uh, glaze because I couldn't afford the compressor or the spray booth. And I didn't have enough money for buckets of glaze in large quantities to dip or pour. So I hand painted my glazes in layers mm. and um, sort of formed a technique through hardship really that sort of follows through to this day of quite simple application and yeah just um, 
quite minimal use of tools and things. And yes, I did have a disaster. It was like I'd been stabbed in the side when I opened that <laughs> kiln and saw that piece. Because um, the reality of running a studio with a lot of assistants, in fact, I have two studios and employing people and trying to pay them as fairly as I can, is that sometimes when I invest a lot in a piece, I think I must have invested over ten thousand pounds in the piece that did explode. So yeah, it was wow. apart from you know, the money wasn't the issue, it was just the love and the passion that we all put into a piece and that piece that exploded that you'll see on my Instagram was many people's work all mm. pulled together by my designed and pulled together by myself. Mm. But no, it's a great thing. And sometimes, you know, I don't, the cracks, sometimes cracks will appear and they can be part of the object. It depends on the crack. A mm -hmm. bit like life, really. <laughs> that's, that's... I had this great client. I had this great woman who commissioned a giant pumpkin to celebrate her, her 50th wedding anniversary for her husband, who she called Pumpkin. Mm, and it came lovely. out of the kiln very close to the deadline of their anniversary. And uh, it had a big crack in it. And uh, I phoned her up and I said, um, your, your pumpkins come out of the kiln. It looks beautiful, but I just have to tell you there's a crack in it. And she said, is it a serious crack? I said, no. And in fact, the crack looked a bit like a smile. It was rather funny. And she said, listen, my marriage has had a few cracks. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, as long as it's not a big crack that's going to divide it into, then it's completely fine. And she was so ha happy about the crack, you know, because life is like that sometimes, isn't it? Well, that's, yeah. that's wonderful because one of the reasons I was very keen to, to speak with you about your work is that this series of the podcast that we're doing right now is focused on risk and creative risk. Mm -hmm. But because circumstances have overtaken us, we're, we're having this conversation now in mid-March of 2020, which is, as we understand it, is kind of, we're still on the the coronavirus is still spreading. We haven't reached the peak of the pandemic. And it's really brought into focus the, our well, questions around risk and risk adversity and how we deal with uncertainty and how we deal with just not knowing what's ahead of us. When I was thinking about you and your work and your process, my feeling was that you deal with this on quite a regular basis, N not on the same scale as, as a pandemic, obviously, but mm. are, are there perhaps lessons that you've taken or ways of thinking that you've cultivated a, as you've been developing your practice to mm. deal with that uncertainty, that not knowing of, of investing so much into something and mm. not, not knowing what's going to come out the other end? Uh, is it going to live up to expectation? And particularly because I know that you also take on large scale commissions, which I'd also yeah. like to talk to you about, where again, yeah. you, you might be putting forward a, an idea for, a, for the commission process, but that obviously will change throughout the process and there are other factors that you have to take on board and what you start out trying to achieve may not be what comes up the other end. And how you manage that process mentally as a creative person to think about the, the potential for failure or the potential for disappointment as you, go, as you go through the process of creating something? Well, let's talk about the public art, because I think the risk mm. is, is greatest there, if one wants to talk mm. about that. And the, um, so for, I've been practicing for 35 years as a potter uh, since I left the Royal College of Art. And I've always uh, worked in three areas. So there's the glaze research, which we've touched on, the studio ceramics, which we've touched on, and which Instagram shows very well. Um, and then there's the public art. And in a way, the public art is a balance to the decadence and luxury of making extravagant and decadent and expensive studio ceramics. And uh, it's serving a certain purpose in museums and for collectors. But on the opposite end of the scale, the public art serves communities. And I'm very interested in communities, I think. Mm. With politics, we're sort of powerless to change the big politics, but the small politics of our community, that being our family, our neighbours, our professional community and working communities. I'm very interested in those. So the public art serves that. And so for 20 years, I've done maybe 30 years, maybe 15 to 20 projects for schools, hospitals, parks, libraries, which involve making fountains or wall murals, storytelling. I like making storytelling walls, uh, interactive ones for children. 
And the most recent was a facade for a building, which wasn't a public building. It's a private office building with a shop at the bottom. But essentially, it was sort of uh, encompassed my opinion that architecture is art for all mm -hmm. on the streets. So this was a building on Savile Row, mm -hmm. and it was a collaboration with uh, an architect called EPR Architects. And um, had I known what... So you're talking about risk, mm. and I'd like to know, it, well, there's conscious risk, isn't there, where you're aware of everything around you, and you, mm -hmm. you take a balanced, like we're in this dreadful time of the coronavirus and the, really the start of everything with a, a, a large range of possibilities and fears ahead of us. Um, and I suppose taking on a big project, which transpired to be a million and a half pounds in English money, um, had I known, if, if I'd been aware of the risk, I, mean, I was mildly aware of the risk. I spent 10% on my fee on lawyer's contracts to protect my home and family. But had I been aware of it all, I probably wouldn't have done it. So I think I'm, I'm not a risk taker, but I have blind faith. <laughs> I, think, I think I have a confidence in my ability that could be also blind as well. But um, I don't know. Uh, it's very interesting. So to take on a project like the facade of a building, which was a seven story building, and we hung 11 tons of tiles on, on the front of this building on Savile Row and Conduit Street in Mayfair in London. And uh, there was a huge amount of risk. Um, it wasn't really as much my risk because I think I was being, I made sure, I'm quite sensible commercially that I was being paid all along in stages in case mm. anything went wrong. But the risk that architects take these days in inventing projects, seeing them through and then signing them off was just mind boggling, you know. So it made me think really that um, my risk um, is quite not very big, really. Mm. But I do take projects on not really realizing how much there is to do, especially with public art. I always say to my students, and I've passed a few projects on recently to my assistants, which they've done instead of me, because I've been busy. It's 5% inspiration and 95% perspiration, really, mm. because it really is tough. You're, dealing, you're in a team, you're dealing with other people, but also, obviously, the advantages that come with risk is challenges, really, and I love a challenge. Uh -huh. I suppose I play safe in my studio when I make pots, and obviously there are risks that they'll explode or risks that it'll fall over and stuff. There's quite small risk, but the risks in public art are sort of magnified ones. So it's very exciting. And also I lead a team in both my studios because I'm the sort of boss, but to then go into public art and not be the boss and be part of an, a greater thing is also really exciting. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a bit like, yeah, uh, studio pottery, when you make something, it, it's a bit like being a child at Christmas and you don't know of that gift under the tree that's wrapped up. That you're not allowed to open till the last minute, till Christmas Day. You don't know if it's going to be the thing you've always wanted or something awful. And really ceramics, studio ceramics is a bit like that. You know, you've got the final reveal on the, on the kiln opening. And um, it's just uh, really exciting. And I suppose mm. the satisfaction of a large project, the Savile Row project, took four years. So the reveal of that was just fantastic, really. So it sort of scales up the pleasure, I suppose. Mm. And w when you're in the middle of that, when you're going along, there, there must be, I, can, I can't ever imagine it being a smooth trajectory oh, from <laughs> winning the commission through to have, you know, unveiling the finished product. What, oh. What keeps you going? Well, it's troubleshooting, I suppose, and a vision and wanting to, you know, have, wanting to do something I said I would do, I mm. suppose. I'm quite, I'm quite loyal like that. You know, if I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. So mm. having undertaken something, I jolly well have to show it through. But the, oh, the Savile Row and the one before that, the uh, American Express talk mm -hmm. storytelling, well, it was hell. You know, it's really hard, mm. really, really hard um, physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. really hard and sort of so, yeah I just wonder why you know in the middle of it you wonder why you're doing it and then yeah. of course 
in hindsight, everything gets a bit easier and the memories soften and yeah. it's just a great thing. And it's really great to serve a community and not mm. just serve myself. Yeah, you know, It's self-serving to make pottery in a way. Of, of course, we're making cups and bowls and things for people to use, and that's different. But decorative art, which is my sort of major bit of my studio pottery, it's quite self I don't know. Is it? No, it's not. I don't think it's so. I like to please others. That's why I make my pots. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think the, the arts are a fascinating conjunction of, of the, not necessarily self-serving, but you're, you're expressing yourself in what it is that you make, but for other people to enjoy. To a large hopefully extent. hopefully <laughs> yeah, absolutely hopefully. well uh, you know even if just one person enjoys yeah. it then you you've exactly. brightened someone else's day <laughs> you, you've yeah. affected someone else's world but it has to be it, well it doesn't have to be but i yeah, i think that a lot of us are striving for creating something that is a genuine expression of ourselves or our world view so there is a, a degree of of self-interest in how we approach the making of, of what it is that we're producing but the overarching intention is that it is put out into the world and shared and that's where it it grows in meaning and impact as other people bring yes. their own perceptions to it their own views their own aesthetics to it and enjoy it or don't enjoy it but when you're getting to the end of a project and it's getting close or, or, or particularly a public commission and you're getting to that point where it is going to be shared with the public what what happens with your confidence in what you've done is that are, are you yes quite, that's quite a good question <laughs> by by the process yeah. that great this is amazing or yeah um, because you're coming to that final reveal that point where people now will be able to see it and judge it how do you how do you think about or manage that process yeah that's very interesting actually well normally my motivation for doing a public artwork is that it's a it's something for the community that's there Mm. So for it to be site specific or for it to be educational as to the history of the area or for it to be used like a storytelling wall, it means it has a function. Mm. And um, so for the great reveal, I think um, because I feel like I'm, I'm doing it as a gift to a community and it's not actually for myself, um, it means that it's just a great feeling, like when you give a present to somebody and you know they're going to like it or you hope they're going to like it. I mean, it's very interesting. I, t I mentioned blind faith earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, public art is a huge responsibility because if it doesn't serve a purpose or if it's not liked and it's there in the public eye, it's an offense. You know, it's a mm -hmm. great responsibility to make something that is meaningful to people. And um, I think in most of the cases where I have. Uh, been chosen to make a piece of public art when I ask the councillors or the council who've decided who's you know often a piece of public art there's a gateway or a fountain or or something for a hospital that uh, is to uh, distract uh, the patients and things normally they interview more than one artist in fact in every case I think they have to nowadays mm -hmm. and I ask them why they chose me and normally they say it's because it's so clear that you're it's not about you as an artist expressing your own uh, self, although that is part of it. Of course, it's part of it because one's style comes through and one's the spirit of the work hopefully comes through. But you're serving a purpose. And I think mm. public art should do that. It should be beautiful. It should lift, or inf lift the spirit or inform or all those things. And it needs to be safe, you know, the, all the prerequisites of fire risk and things mm. falling off and things falling over and the way sort of tiles are fixed on onto walls so that they, if they were to fall, they'd hurt somebody very seriously. So there are all those practical things. So, I mean, it's a, it's a sense of relief, really, just to, just to have got it done. <laughs> And then it's over the years that it becomes the, the, the taste or the scent of that project gets stronger or better. And I feel like I've done a good job. Mm. But normally, like, like a potter making a teapot that has to pour well mm -hmm. or a cup that's lovely to, to hold and to put to the lip, I think public art um, has functions to have a community and to embrace the place that it is in. And I think those are things that sort of take away the pressure from whether 
So, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's a, it's a, it's a constant thing. But the, hmm. as I get older, the more I realise the responsibility. Before, I didn't really think about it. I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to get a budget. I'm going to make a thing. It's going to be fabulous. And then over time, you realise that maybe certain things, one or two things, I look at and think, oh, I should have done that a bit differently or better, or you know. But you just have to. I think. I think you just have to keep going and not ask too many questions of yourself. I don't mm. know. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, that goes back to the confidence that you spoke of, that you have a real confidence in yourself and your own abilities. Mm. How, how do you think that developed? Um, my mom was really confident. My dad, my mom and dad both really confident. My dad's sport was a sports journalist mm. and I had two brothers and they were sort of quite everybody was quite sporty so i suppose there's this sort of competitive aggression that's not not nasty in me but i saw it and felt it from my family so um i think that confidence comes from that a physical mm. confidence i was a very good swimmer i you know, played hockey for the school you know i was quite confident physically um so i don't know i think it's i think it, you could also call it ignorance, you know, of, uh, uh, and I've mentioned blind faith uh, yeah. and like love and hate, like ignorance and knowledge. And, you know, they're all things that are very close to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's those scientists who break the rules and sort of play with ignorance that sometimes must have made the biggest invent discoveries, you know, mm -hmm. so I don't know. It's very interesting, but it never, I think, the more I do it, the less I feel I know and the more I feel I'm aware of the repercussions of things because I was watching Netflix and my daughter the other day and there's two types of intelligence, aren't there? There's the, um, there's the flow intelligence, mm -hmm. which is kind of your physical and mental ability to deal with things quickly and intelligently. And there's what I love to hear, the crystalline intelligence. <laughs> that's what it's actually officially called. And that's about years and years of doing things and that crystallizing into a knowledge and a sort of an awareness with your hands and mind that you can't get when you're in your 20s mm. hence i'm going into my 60s going into top gear and yes. uh, really looking forward to hopefully making my best pieces wonderful mm. yeah great i know i would love to talk to you about that in a minute but i'm, I'm curious about just to stick with the idea of public art and commissions when you're doing these kinds of big projects, you're obviously collaborating with other, uh, well, with industry, with, with architects and, and builders. And how do you think you benefit from working with these other, other sectors and the, the, the other pools of knowledge? Well, like you've said, really, that your podcast is really interested in, in, in creativity across the board mm. in different practices. You know, I'm fascinated. I sort of wanted to be an architect when I was a kid. Mm. So to actually be working alongside some of London's greatest architects, greatest minds, is just such an honour, really. Mm. And um, I think that's the root of it. I, I suppose you might say there's, that some artists might say that a collaboration is a compromise, and again, it's these sort of compromise or collaboration or uh, inspiration or innovate. You know, they're all things that are sort of words that are very interesting. And um, I just, I work, I'm the boss, as I've mentioned in my studio. I mm. decide what's made and we make it and my team help assist me to do those things. But when you're working with another team, you know, sometimes it's quite relaxing to sort of be part of a greater thing than your own abilities. And I think it's that which is so exciting. Hmm. And do you feel that they benefit from working with you? That there's something. Oh, that you'd you have get? to ask them that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think some of them go, "Oh my God, here comes Kate, and here comes trouble." Because right. I'm, I'm a bit of a stickler, and I, you know, I demand quite a lot of attention. I think as far as emailing and and clarification of things mm. are concerned, because you know, on a big project, you can imagine you have to be clear. And on a big building project, you're dealing with architects. You're also dealing with the on-site builders, and you're also mm. dealing with the local council and community. So it is a bit of a juggling act. Uh, mm. between different communities and again it's not about making compromises to a project it's about collaborating and and uh you know i always let the history of a site speak if the hidden history i'm very interested in hidden mm. histories with public art so you know the school might be where there was once 
a village blacksmith or, you know, there's all sorts of historical layers that I think are fascinating. And uh, I think public art can reveal that without mm -hmm. it looking too crass, you know. Uh, so it is a fine balance between uh, it looking ridiculous and like it's some kind of lesson about the area and it being a beautiful object. So yeah. Yeah, it's really challenging, like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also now you've spoken about having two teams at, at your two studios. Yeah. At what point did you decide that was the direction to go versus maintaining a solo practice <laughs> well jeremiah i didn't decide really um it decided life decided for me really um i have to admit uh i do love uh, one of the things about this coronavirus is that i might get some days on my own in the studio which is rather frightening now because i'm so um uh, conditioned to having so many pairs of hands helping me because uh, they're all working from home uh, mm -hmm. we've got a you know they're all they've all got a plan uh, to work from home for me but um essentially uh i didn't decide i i, I like making big things i used i taught used to teach once a day a week in the 80s as a university of ceramics course one of the students asked to help in the studio and in fact then many students are always looking for internships and work experience that wasn't the case when i was uh, studying but uh, really since the 70s and 80s students would write and ask if they could help and I'm not the type of person to say no unless I absolutely have to so they started coming and then I formed relationships with them uh, and really some of my assistants have been around for 12 15 years on and off mm. according to their need or my need um, and they sort of it sort of grew really um the public art demanded a lot of help you know mm -hmm. as the projects got bigger i needed more help and um i've been very uh committed to the fact that as uh, first of all i have a team of 10 to 12 uh, assistants and i have two office staff um i'm very committed to providing them with a stable income mm -hmm. because i know how important that is so uh, if I take someone on for two days a week, whether I need them or not, and there are times where I really need them and there are times where I don't, I have to design things that they can make uh, for me because I commit to that. A lot of makers just employ assistants and interns as they need them on and off, on and off, on and off. And I think for a long standing relationship and a professional relationship, one has to pledge to a security, if you like. Mm. So, so they all know that they have this income from me and they can have their own studios and they can try and move forward in an ideal world they'll leave me and uh, get better than me which is actually happening at the moment actually <laughs> one of my assistants my art dealer has started to show his work mm. and he sh and we had a show in new york and uh, my assistant sold out and i didn't sell anything <laughs> <laughs> which took a bit you know it's a bit of a sour tablet to swallow uh, for about 10 minutes and then I realized you know I would have pref I wanted it that way around I would rather mm. that they had sold and I he had sold and I hadn't and so um, it's a sort of growth thing and uh, I do t I get people writing every week now asking to help and at the moment to do a job properly or to have an assistant or an intern properly one has to commit to them so i i'm turning them away at the moment but i do have this amazing fluxing team and they'll start as interns some of them age 14 15 16 and then do their university then come back and then be an assistant on a very low wage for six months or a year and then when their skills develop so that my business can uh, profit or at least break even on on what their input is i then pay them more and it sort of steps up over the mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. and it's just the most joyous thing to see them grow for them to help me mm -hmm. and the fact is that i didn't choose to have this great team that i'm having to sort of issue instructions to from a distance during the virus um but i am committed to it mm -hmm. and so and they and from that so i'm not an angel they're committed back and they you know they have to have a level of commitment so it's really a very two-way thing really mm. and as they get better at their jobs i can pass on projects that i can't do so it's just like expanding the family business really yes. my interest isn't isn't making tons of money it's it's being able to buy the equipment that i want and make the things that i want and maintain a, a great lifestyle which we mm. do really so.
Wonderful. I suppose that is. Mm. And Seems to be good. Obviously, it has its difficult moments. Oh, I'm sure. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm curious about, well, we talk about um, artists finding their voice and, mm. or their, their style, their, their way of expressing themselves. And I'm curious, both from your own perspective and how you felt that that evolved for you and, and also the perspective that you have as someone who has been managing young people and helping them develop their practice as, they've, as they progress. Do you have any thoughts on how one goes about discovering their voice, finding their voice, identifying their voice? Yes, well, that really comes through to risk, doesn't it? That's the sort of mm. subject of this. Um, I think finding a voice or have it, so or having a voice or developing a voice, they're all very different things. I think my voice has been there since I was kind of born. I look at the th things that I made when I was 10 or 11 that I gave to my grandma. And they're very similar to the, 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 <laughs> the things that I make now. They're sort of juicy and round, and then they have, and then there's a simple shape with lots of additions on it. I made these sea urchins and hedgehogs and things. But the sort of occupation of craft, of repetitive craft, was there right from the start. The fact that I love shiny things, you know, there's a sort of, in the ceramics world, there's a sort of matte brigade where people, you know, don't like shiny. They're fantastic. Look at Lucy Ree and people like that. They're not shiny brigade, are they? No. And then there's the sort of shiny one. I'm a shiny one. And uh, I just think my voice has always been there. And I suppose confidence makes your voice uh, mm. stronger mm -hmm. and so I was quite confident I had to be confident because I had two brothers who were quite strong and so I had to sort of be confident between them I was the middle of three children so I had to have this confidence right from the start and I think I had it naturally mm. and then the voice just gets stronger the more success you have more mm. I mean I, I you know it's hard the first 10 years were really hard uh, you know I never knew uh, whether I was going to have to sort of max out my debit or credit cards at the beginning so um so a voice comes through adversity but at the same time through confidence i don't know it's mm. fascinating but then other people have a voice and you have to dig around and find it and the way you find mm. it is mm. by taking risks and one of the things that you, that i've found by running a, two studios one in the countryside and one in london that it's quite hard to take risks because risk costs money you know yes, it costs yeah. time and so I almost promised myself, so when I've made a couple of pieces that I, I've so enjoyed and I'm so absorbed and I'm so pleased with them at the end of the day, although you never know what they're going to turn out like really, um, I'll give myself a sort of risk holiday. Oh, and I've got a challenge idea. at the end of our blog spot. But it's mm -hmm. about sort of putting together, juxtaposing things that you would never think of or taking a pot and turning it upside down and throwing it on the floor or or if something goes wrong, they're going with it. So mm. it's, I think you find your voice, well, you also find your voice with skills. The more skill you have mm. in the material, the louder the voice you have. In a, in a way, your skills when you're making is like, it's like an alphabet, uh, which you put words together. So you have skills, you put pots together as if they're words, and you're communicating with the outside world. And, uh, it's just uh, a voice and you're you, like you've said earlier jeremiah you said you know our work is the expression of ourselves uh and mine is well if you look at my work it tends to be a bullion i mm -hmm. hope generous uh, rather heavy <laughs> and i'm quite heavy myself <laughs> and uh, my pots are often very stable and secure i hate to have a wobbly pot that mm -hmm. if you were to jog the table it would fall over so Often my pots are almost as wide as they are tall. Mm. And if they're, if they're taller than they are wide, they have a very spread foot. Mm -hmm. So this, this sense of security and stability, which I would like to think now and admit that that's probably what I uh, encompass, you know, as an older woman. I just think it's uh, fascinating. But yeah, the voice, how do you find it? I think you just have to, I mean, I've mentioned blind faith before. You know, mm. there are other potters who plan and they think, and they, and their all their work is in their head. My work is from my guts. Mm. You know, my objective is that somebody will see one of my pieces and it'll give them a feeling in their stomach, not in their brain. 
if that makes Lovely. sense. Yes, no, uh, absolutely. I don't know. So it's about just taking risk or, or, or not even, I mean, what, what the, what's the worst thing that happened if you're throwing on the wheel and you take a few risks, you know, you've mm -hmm. lost a few days work. So I don't, it's very interesting, isn't it? I suppose if you asked an artist or an actor or anybody in a different profession, it would be about taking stepping out of your comfort zone which mm. i do try and make myself do yes i do mm. I, to. I think the public art is one of those ways of stepping out of my comfortable studio yeah i think that's one of, yeah one of those i think it's well to my mind there's a uh well you're talking about the how close certain things are together ignorance and knowledge and for me play play and risk mm. are essentially the same uh, different sides of the same coin that it just maybe the stakes are higher when you when we use the word risk but if we can take the stakes out of a period of exploration it can be become playful and it sounds like you you intentionally create space for that where you can try out ideas be more experimental break things throw things and see what happens and play with the materials the process and and your own expectations of, of what something should be or should look like yeah, just I should just correct you a little bit there. I might have misled you. I don't really break or throw things. I, I wouldn't dare. But I do oh. take risks aesthetically. You know, a lot of my assistants, if they listen to this, go, when have we, when's a Kate ever broken or thrown? You know, actually, a piece fell off the desk onto the floor uh, recently, and I picked it up and made it into a different piece because it was squashed. But, yeah, no, it, there's, there's modicums of risk, aren't there? And I'm quite a safe risk taker, really. Small steps. And you mentioned your, your first 10 years were, again, this is kind of coming back to that idea of risk. The first 10 years were really difficult and you weren't sure you, how much debt you might have to incur to keep going. What kept you going in such difficult times? Just my addiction to clay, really. Hmm. You know, I just, just, I mean, my husband and my daughter sort of suffer it, really, because I just... <laughs> You know, it, it is, and you meet, and I meet people, I'm just doing this big charity thing and lots of other sort of high profile potters I'm talking to and they will go, oh my God, I've got a deadline and I've got to do this and I've got to, and you just get addicted to this material and the, mm. and, and, and the whole thing. It's just extraordinary. Um, so I, I think it's an addiction. Yeah, I'm quite an addictive personality actually. Oh, and I think this is a very healthy healthy way to, <laughs> to, to, okay. to help you know yeah yeah very interesting questions jeremiah okay well I, I i have just a few more if you're if you're happy with it i do yeah okay i've just well, got one little note on a bit of paper here while we're talking about so you can take risks physical risks uh by throwing things or cutting things in half or mixing mm -hmm. a wild a wild glaze or something uh but you can actually take risks in your mind, can't you? Mm, yes. You yes. know, so one of the great things a potter has to do, any artist really, is it sort of keep an open vision of what a piece is going to be like. It often doesn't turn out that way, but mm -hmm. you sort of have this capability of visualizing. So I might have an idea and I'll th um, be making a pot and I'll visualize 10 different types of handles on them or a mm -hmm. 10 different sized feet or a different lid and that i can do and this is this crystallized intelligence i can kind of quite well visualize with like little photographs in my brain and um so you can actually take risks with your crystallized intelligence in your brain it doesn't have to be physical ones so i suppose if you train yourself to be a risk taker where there aren't any consequences but your thoughts, I think that's a very interesting thing to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, it sounds like it's you're almost going through iterations in your mind, so you're not actually acting on uh, on. Yeah, there's less risk because you're not actually doing it, but you're playing through different scenarios or options before you commit to the action. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you can take safe, is that, that's a safe risk, isn't it? <laughs> is, that a, is that an oxymoron? Can you have a safe risk? <laughs> well, we're talking about oxymorons all, all we, we through are, this yes. conversation, yeah, aren't yeah. we? And so you, you also mentioned your, uh, your dealer that you, because you, oh, yes. you work with the Sassoon Gallery, and that's, the, that's like the, the top, well, it's the only 
dealer or gallery that I'm aware of that does fine art and ceramics and puts the two together at, at such a high level, at, at a, you know, a really exclusive luxury market, particularly for ceramics, which are generally within the craft sector and so don't really reach that, that level of, of uh, audience or, or even price tag. And I'm curious to what your feelings are, I guess on two fronts. One, when there is a higher price tag for a piece of work, that is private. So we're moving away from the mm. public art, um, mm. which is something that, that a pr one individual may enjoy in their private collection or in their home. But there is a yeah. high price tag to that. Yeah. How, how there there is there an additional pressure or sense of, huh. uh, of worry about how, if not the last piece that sold the next piece and how that would, yeah. because you, as you said, your, one of your, <laughs> one of your assistants has uh, sold more than you did at the last show. Yeah. How, how do you manage that, that expectation that might, be, because there's a reputation now you are Kate Malone and people know <laughs> what they're expecting. And so when you put a, create a new piece, uh, how do you manage that, that expectation of your audience or, or your collectors or your dealer yeah. and your own expectations of, of what that should be? Hmm. There's lots of questions in that whole thing. So yes, first sorry. of all, just to deal with Adrian Sassoon, we kind of grew up together in a way. Okay. I'm two years older than him and he's been showing my work for 23 years. So he approached me with a little letter saying that he'd like to show my work um, 23 or four years ago, something like 25 years ago. And uh, he is a um, really interesting character in that he shows antique. He's always, he's an antique expert, and particularly mm. in the, the subject of Sèvres. He wrote a book for the Getty Museum about Sèvres as a young man. He's a very extraordinary man. He's two years younger than me. And um, he sort of gradually just put ceramics and silversmithing and glassware and every, craft absolute craft, right into the realms that none of us actually knew existed. You know, he mm -hmm. puts us in shows, fine art shows and antique shows where art and antiques are shown side by side in Park Avenue in New York and in London on, in you know, at the Masterpiece Exhibition and in Tefaf in Maastricht, these extraordinary shows. And in a way, he, well, he, apart from my husband, uh, have been hugely influential in what I make and how I make and, um, yeah, what I make really. And he's always said, you know, have confidence in the work, do exactly what you want and he will try to sell it, uh, not to worry how long something takes. So he's been very instrumental in me sort of having confidence in mm. uh, putting all these hours into pot. So there is to do, you can take risk, but I still take risks with him. Often he's, he and his staff say they don't quite know what to expect when a delivery arrives and they pull something out that's very different. Mm. Although it's got my uh, voice and it's got mm -hmm. the characteristics that are mine and those who are in the know might know it's made by me, but it could be quite different to usual. They quite dread, I think, and look forward <laughs> to the surprises of, of my deliveries. But mm. um, so, and he's encouraged a huge amount of makers. He's changed the whole field of decorative arts in the last 20 years in England and, and has set incentive for young makers to go up to the standards and the quality of, of uh, professionalism in, in craft and technique. He's really setting, setting a very high bar for everybody. And your question really was, um, how does it, so yeah, sometimes I look at the price tags on the stands and I'm like, oh my God, you know, that's, uh, let's say 40,000. And, you know, that's the price of two really lovely cars or three cars. You know, how can that be it? Because I don't come from that world of the price of things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all relative. And I tell myself it's all relative because £200 is a lot to me and £2,000 is a lot to someone else and £20,000. So it's down to relativity. And, and in my eyes, I put things out there and hope that they're going to sell. I have this blind faith. But then if they don't, then I make other things that do. So I sort of have quite a wide uh, repertoire of things that's constantly expanding and changing. And, and as pieces sell, that gives me confidence in a range that will develop. So it's quite complicated and, and very interesting and very exciting. 
but yes um yeah i just sometimes i dare myself to be more and more playful and uh, send it to adrian and and i can't i wonder how somebody's going to like it enough to pay that much money for it and give it a home mm -hmm. and look after it for for the foreseeable future and um i'm amazed that they do and other times i think i've sent him something fabulous and it doesn't sell so well so it's so many prerequisites with selling things that I just simply get on with it and I'm lucky enough because it's harder to sell something than it is to make it I'm lucky enough to have Adrian Sassoon and his team mm. working so hard and with such grace and clarity to, to sell things to the market that they're presenting it to so it's just again right time right place you know like my art education in the 70s i just lucky to hit that gold seam of gold in education where hmm. you know we did try everything and our hand skills were developed as a young child i mean i work very much now with education trying to get craft and skills and hand abilities and possibilities into young people uh, hmm. people's lives as a result of that experience hmm. wonderful have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, it, yes. Well, yeah. well yeah. I guess it's it. It sounds like you're you're in a fantastic feedback loop where you gain confidence from you know, the more things sell. Yeah. You know, then the it, it kind of feeds back into your your confidence that the next thing probably will. But it, is there any? Does doubt ever come into play? Where? Yeah, you, doubt. Yeah. Oh yes. One always. <laughs> one always doubts oneself as to whether one is uh, you like you say i have a reputation do i deserve mm -hmm. it i don't know do all i know is all i know is jeremiah is that i just keep doing it and it seems to work so you don't feel that 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 reputation or that expectation is in any way uh, binding or no restrictive no no uh, it's, it's liberating it's the opposite oh wonderful okay yeah yeah i think it's lib you know it i mean it's liberating in that my wonderful husband who's a builder has worked you know we've been together for 37 years he's always worked to build me studios so that i'm liberated with equipment and mm. i've always had tiny spaces in london it's only recently i've got more space but i've been liberated by the possibility of having a secure and stable studios a lot of artists have to rent their studios mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I did at the beginning. And uh, in fact, I had a free studio from the GLC, but that's another story for one and a half years. Wow. But really, um, yeah, it's just down to possibilities and pushing forward and having blind faith and wondering. Doubt is a huge part. Yeah, definitely. I always wonder if I'm a good enough wife or a good enough mother. I mean, don't we all, isn't that the nature of mm. everything? No? And, and so how do you answer that? How, how do you keep that at bay or keep that from, from preventing you? Oh, I just tend that? not to think about it too much and just get on with it. <laughs> okay, just ignore it. <laughs> just, yeah, just get on. I mean, yeah. one at Mojup was my fantastic teacher. Mm -hmm. He passed yeah. away last year. And uh, he's just like, get on with it. You know, stop worrying about whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. If there's something you want to do, just get on with it and put yourself in a position where you can get on with it. And uh, it's as simple as that, really. Mm. I think, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm not a thinker, I'm a doer. And that's mm -hmm. always been the case, really. And so it's a case of sucking it and seeing and if it works, I carry on with it. And yeah, yeah. Fantas mm. It's a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very asking welcome. Asking such nice questions. You, you, you mentioned that you're that you're you're go you're moving into your 60s and that you're moving yeah. into top gear so <laughs> do you feel that there are advantages that have come with the asian experience that you have and how are you looking forward to the next decade um okay so let's i'm gonna write this down because i'm getting old now i haven't got my short-term memories a bit lacking i'm sorry i i tend to pack a lot of questions <laughs> no in. that was a joke that was a joke so what was the oh, oh. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> um, how do I deal with going into my six as well? Well, you Let's sound very positive about, about it. Oh yes, I mean, as long as my health, uh, uh, you know, that's the main thing, isn't it? Is that your strength? And I've noticed, you know, I make big pots and they're heavy, mm. 
Mm. And uh, I have to have assistants to help me move them much more than before. And I still think I'm superwoman in the middle of the night and packing the kiln and cantilevering heavy shells, you know, far more uh, d stupidly than I should do. But uh, I just get on with it, really. And um, I do think there's this crystallized. Uh, we talked about crystalline intelligence, which is my mm. new thing. that I watched Netflix with my daughter about people. Yeah. And um, it was just, it's just, it is, there's this, it's a waste not to carry on and not to try and keep pulling it together and uh, using the skills that I've developed. So when I say I'm going to top gear, I don't know if I'm ever going to do a huge Savile Row seven story building again. Mm. Although if it came up, I probably would because I have this blind faith. Although I wouldn't want to do something the same again, obviously it's the challenge of the different that's so exciting. Um, I just feel like I've just moved into a new space. I've got, I, People used to come to my studio in London and actually literally stand in this little space and say, where is your main studio? And I'd say, this is it. You know, I've managed in a very tight and concise and tidy and organized space in the middle of London for 30 years. And so this is a new phase of having a barn where my pug room and mold store is bigger than my studios that I've ever had. Mm. You know, so I've just, I have this new sense of space uh, that I'm just getting used to. And I hope, you know, one always hopes as a maker, whether you're younger or older, that the next one is going to be better than the one you've just done. Mm -hmm. So in, that's what I suppose I mean. And top gear, I mean, the fact that I've got this some fantastic workforce that ranges in age from sort of 20 to uh, 50. I'm trying to think who's 50. Oh, yeah, one of them was 50 years on her birthday. So, uh, you know, I've got them... And because we've worked so long and so close, it's almost as if they're sort of semi-extensions of my skill. So I'm able to push forward with them, hopefully, the virus permitting. Yes. Which brings us into this awful situation mm. Mm. of being holed up in Kent <laughs> and having well, a deep freeze full of bread. <laughs> <laughs> Fant <laughs> fantastic. Kate, this has been such a, a lovely conversation. And... Uh, just, I, I know I, we've ranged all over the shop, but uh, there's- We have, really... I'm sorry. That tends to be the case with me, really. No, no, no. Those are my questions. Like, because, and you've been very generous in, in exploring them with me, which I really, really <laughs> appreciate. Um, before we wrap up, do you have a creative challenge for listeners? Well, I do. Um, yes. Yeah, so the creative challenge is, um, so is to make something out of leftovers. Oh. So- um, Often leftovers when you're cooking are a bit tastier the next day than the main meal, aren't they? Mm. Jeremiah, you know, where you have fry up all your stuff, like on Boxing Day. Yeah. Um, and it's often the best bit. So uh, my challenge really is um, often I'd be making a big piece that might have had 200 balls on it or 10 cubes. And then I'll have another piece on the desk, which has all these funny snap dragons on that are like pistachio nuts bursting with seeds. And then I'll have... A, a pot that was sort of half made and has been kept wet and wrapped in plastic for a long time. And sometimes I give myself these creative holidays where I sort of open them up and there's no risk really because they're leftovers mm -hmm. from other things. And I put them together with clarity and focus and judgment with the crystallized intelligence that we're all <laughs> developing as we get older and create, um, I call it a wild card. You know, it's kind of this wild thing that sits on the shelf and sometimes you can't quite make it out. And, and then over time, with hindsight, with it sitting in the corner, you, it really is probably more exciting than the main meal. And uh, so that's my challenge is the wild card leftover challenge. That is fantastic. I absolutely love that. That's such a great challenge. Thank you so much. And that'll be so great for all of us to think about what, what are our leftovers and what is the potential within them. And I and also love the idea of maybe putting that together, but then having it, but, but not judging it, not, not, mm. uh, n yeah, not, not criticizing it immediately, but putting it aside and having it in the corner of your vision so that you can revisit it because chances are it will be a stretch it'll be something different from what, so it might take some time to see the potential in it or come to appreciate its own 
inherent beauty or challenge that it holds. You're a very wise young man, Jeremiah. <laughs> in fact, in fact, one of my leftovers, I'm now going to confess, is standing in the Victorian Albert Museum in the big circle of great makers. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. That is fantastic. Brilliant. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Kate, so much for being so generous with your time. Um, and we mentioned your Instagram account. Where, where, where else can people find you online? Yes, thanks, Jeremiah. Well, there's, um, there's my website, which is www.katemaloneceramics.com. And there you can dig around right into my website. It's, it's, it's motives are educational as, as my Instagram is. And you can get right in and turn the pages of my sketchbooks and what, read Ooh. old catalogs and watch lots of films and things. If you, you have to dig. You have to be quite proactive in it. And then, uh, so that's that. And there are links within that across to Adrian Sassoon's website, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, adriansassoon.com. And uh, he has, on all his artists, it's a really lovely website, he has a section called Works Sold. So it's not just works for sale, but there's a whole library of pieces that have sold in the past. And you can scroll down through mine and sort of see the styles changing through time, the sort of voice changing through time, Wonderful. which is quite nice. And then there's my Instagram, which is Kate, lower school Malone, lower school ceramics. And that is, uh, yeah, day to day adventures of my cat and my dog and uh, <laughs> my kiln <laughs> uh, well kate thank you so much this has been an absolutely pleasure and uh you've been just so generous with your time and your knowledge your, your flowing knowledge and your crystalline knowledge <laughs> <laughs> one of which is diminishing obviously. right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but thank you. That it's been absolutely delightful. Thank you, and I look forward to listening to other of your blogs. Oh, I know. So, what do you what do you act? Are you into modern or or classics or what? Well, I, uh, most of my work is actually in children's telly. And so, oh. um, <laughs> if you're a fan of the Teletubbies, I was Tinky yes. Winky. No, no, yes. yeah, is it <laughs> Tinky Winky's on the phone. <laughs> Jeremiah was Tinky Winky. We loved Scats with Scarlet. <laughs> Tinky Winky was her favourite. <laughs> We've got Tinky Winky on the phone. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. amazing, Jeremiah. Well, I feel like there's, it, there's an interesting uh, potential. Uh, please don't take offence at this, but there <laughs> between a yeah. Teletubby, a Teletubby's in your pots. In yeah, shape, no, shape and, and color. Well, I wish we'd gone over this earlier because I think there's, I love the Teletubbies with Scarlet because it encompassed everything that I sort of, not really thinking about it, like, uh, uh, and just sort of getting on with it and having a lovely time. So yeah, there is a very strong parallel. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, well, uh, there you go. I'm glad you, you're not offended. But just because they are so, they're no. colorful, they're joyful, no. they're generous, all the things that you that use. You, you, Thank you. Yeah, no, I'd love work. to be compared to the Teletubbies. That's perfect. <laughs> I really, I'm going to have to cite that now as oh. as one of my one of my you know big influences. I hadn't realised, but it is that actually. <laughs> Hey there, just a few things before you go. Are you a practicing artist or creative? Could your practice benefit from a boost? I've put together 52 dares and challenges to inspire and invigorate any creative practice. These include challenges to collaborate with an animal, create nude self-portraits, and even prompts around pricing and selling your work. You can find out more on the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life or on Instagram at practicalcreative. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with a friend, subscribe to the show, and leave a review on iTunes. It not only helps to extend the reach of the podcast, it also shares the fantastic work of all of my guests. Finally, if you're looking for a bit of inspiration at work, check out my other Instagram, at Art for Entrepreneurs, where I create and share original artwork and posters inspired by some of the biggest names in entrepreneurship. That's at Art for, F-O-R, Entrepreneurs. Thanks for listening. Until next time.